Okay, good afternoon everyone and thank you for all joining us today for the second of three Crick seminar events. So firstly, I'll ask that you all mute yourselves and turn off your cameras if you haven't done so already. So on behalf of Caval and the Crick Seminar Committee, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands across Australia and New Zealand where we live, learn and work. I'm on Wurundjeri land and if you know the land you're on today, feel free to put that in the chat. We acknowledge and celebrate the inherent strengths of Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander and other First Nations peoples and communities and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters, sky and culture and we pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So this afternoon we have three 15 minute presentations lined up, followed by a facilitated discussion. If you have questions for the speakers throughout the session, please ask them through the Slido link, which is in the chat and on the slideshow. And you can also go to slido.com or use the Slido app using the event code 45700. Before introducing the speakers, I just want to thank my fellow Krieg Seminar Committee members for their hard work in putting this webinar series together. It couldn't have been done without each of you. So our first speaker is Beck Muir. Beck is Manager, Libraries West at Victoria University in Melbourne. Beck's presentation will be followed by Nikki Anderson. Nikki is the Open Education Content Librarian at the University of Southern Queensland. And our final presentation will be by Sarah Fennelly, digital designer at Deakin University Library. Our facilitator for today is Hugh Rundle, Manager, Director in Digital Innovation at La Trobe University. So thanks, Beck. I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Ron. I'm going to adjust the full screen share. Perfect. And I'll just see a moment. So good afternoon everyone. As you've just heard, my name is Beck Muir. I'm the manager of Libraries West with Victoria University, as well as a fifth year part-time doctoral candidate with Charles Sturt University. So the Australian Library and Information Association, or ALIA, notes that respect for diversity, individuality and equity for all is central to library service provision and delivery. So looking from an international perspective, the global voice of the sector, the International Federation of Library and Information Associations or IFLA also argues that our profession can be optimized and enriched through global connection and inspiration, the empowerment of professionals in practice and an understanding of the diverse communities we all serve, regardless of public, private, academic or special library or information service. So the positioning of diversity as a core part of service delivery and design is cemented in the IFLA UNESCO Multicultural Library Manifesto that libraries act to serve all members of the community without discrimination. So my presentation today looks at how we offer a seat at the table. It draws from my own research with people with an invisible disability in libraries talking around accessibility. So this discussion can be um, generalised to diversity more broadly, of course, with some disclaimers. I'll talk about some practical questions that we can ask ourselves to build diversity in as part of our design, not in an, as an adding to our service, but as an integrated component, diversity by design. So what does it mean to offer a seat at the table? We tend to talk about libraries and information services, so academic, public or special, as being for all members of our community who meet our criteria, such as a student or staff member, a government employee or a community member. Theoretically, everyone who meets our criteria has a spot at our table. The table is also a metaphor for what we offer. What services do we have available? What resources, what books, what databases, what classes, what sessions, what signage, what toilets? What do we place upon our table for our users to access? Importantly, how do we offer these? What decisions do we make around what we offer? So the quote on the screen is paraphrased from one of the participants in my research for my doctorate looking at how accessibility is experienced by people with an invisible disability as well as staff in the library. So we were speaking about an event promoted and publicised as being accessible. When my interviewee arrived at the event, they found that their particular disability did not match with what the library had planned for it to include. 
So what shapes our decisions around what access is, especially around diversity and disability? So I've largely worked in the field of disability and accessibility, so a lot of my thoughts draw from this area. When we make decisions about how libraries embed and promote access and inclusion, we make these decisions in view of several factors. So what the Equity Resource Centre calls cost and complexities. These factors are really comprehensive. So for today, I'm going to factor in only three, which are knowledges, finances, and the amount of control that we have. So you'll notice from the model on the screen that knowledges are substantially bigger than finances and amount of control. Finances are generally tight in the sector, it's a well-known fact. And as with any industry, the amount of control that we have, either as an organisation or as an individual staff member, can vary. Knowledges, however, are something that generally falls underneath our control. We can all choose how much we want to learn. The fact that you're here today speaks to how you're growing that sphere. So knowledges are a really complex area, but one thing I really want to note is that it's a plural, not a singular. There's no one type of disability or accessibility, everything is pluralized and knowledge is the same. There are multiple forms of knowledge, but regardless of what knowledges are involved, they all speak to community, to ourselves and to our sector. What are the implicit biases that we bring to our work? We all have them. Free tools are available, such as the Project Implicit Guide, to help us understand our own biases and how these can impact on our diversity services. So knowing our personal values also speaks into the world of diversity. The concept of vocational awe tells us that library and information services staff do tend to take personal accountabilities for any failure of their service as a failure of them themselves. So how do we enact our values through our work? How can we speak to our authentic selves in providing diverse services to our community? The Australian Human Rights Commission also maintains a register of accessibility plans. So an accessibility action plan is an important document as they're an outward spacing document that helps tell the reader how the organisation sees and will respond to the diversity in the community. If you're after a bit more information about these, including gap areas and what they're basically predicting for the future, I wrote a bit of a paper about this last year, which is available with the link on screen. So lastly, and most importantly, partnerships. A dinner party is always more engaging when other people are sharing with each other. When there's people there, it's just more fun. So speak to your community, find out about advocacy services, engage in conferences and presentations, share your own findings and your own knowledge and co-produce information and resources. It's all generative. What you share builds on what other people share. And before you know it, you've created an entirely new dish. So partnerships can also speak to the financial side of things as well. If there's a way that you can partner with others, such as through a guest speaker, this can reduce the potential financial impacts and increase your own and community knowledge as well. So that leads on to the next point. A common barrier that I've always um, heard when it comes to accessibility and diversity is it's just too expensive. Sometimes this can be the case, we know that, but otherwise there are always low cost ways of doing things. So for example, you can offer a range of seating, such as a chair near the window or one facing out a door, a chair with an arm, those sort of things. So one thing that came from my research, which kind of surprised me, is how furniture can convey a sense of security and safety. So having a chair that looks out the door, out a glass door, so people can see who's coming in. Having a chair where it's against a wall so that you can convey a silent message of you're safe in this space. There are low cost ways that you can communicate diversity, you can accommodate a wide range of needs without needing to spend any money. So there's also here some free tools available. So I have to admit here, the Australian Library and Disability Literature is limited to the, in comparison to the American one. And there's a few reasons for that. And that goes for most areas of diversity. So the American Library Association has a range of free toolkits and information on diversity services, as does IFLA, ALIA, all of these services. 
So the Equity Resource Centre in Australia also has assessment tools that you can use in this space. So Book Trust also provides some straightforward and low-cost ways that you can increase inclusivity into your library. While written for a children's library, a lot of the findings are applicable no, no matter the library or the information service type. Lastly, let's talk about control. So public libraries must defer through council and university libraries may be limited in what they can do without the approval of the wider university mechanisms. Even our websites can be tightly locked down. We may have a degree of control in being able to request new content, but we may also have a requirement to fit a template or a branded appearance that doesn't necessarily translate to a great user experience. This doesn't mean that we can't make a seat at the diversity table though. We all have some degree of control. For example, we can address our own biases and we can look at how the knowledge, knowledges and information and experiences within our team can be utilised to look at training initiatives. Think about your hiring as well. I might not agree with everything in it, but the Alia Workforce Diversity Trend Report is right on the money when it tells us the diversity of Australian communities has not translated to diversity in the information profession. Think about how you advertise, where you advertise and the wording you use. If you're interested in knowing more about this, there's been a paper out, The Diversity We Seek, the link is on the screen, which talks about hiring in advertisements and the languages and wording we use. So the spheres of knowledge, finance and control shows us that catering at the diversity table doesn't need to be expensive, complex or require high levels of approval. Here are some quick ideas from my research and the literature that you can put into practice. So I note here that libraries and information services are online as well as physical. Don't be limited by only thinking about your physical environment. Indexes and sitemaps are old hat but still valuable. Think font sizes, engaging content, H5P. Create an interactive virtual map that brings up actual photos of the area to help people with wayfinding, or pull on RMIT and create an online library quest game that engages with your users in different ways. Be mindful of Australian standards for website accessibility. And again, go back to your communities. What do the diverse groups of people that we serve ask and need from the sector? So think about your, uh, your spaces as well. There's a lot of debate in the literature about quiet and noisy spaces in the library, but think about how your seating sets up the use of those spaces and how your signs and colours convey subtle cues. There's a paper on this, the link is on the screen. So however you seek feedback, also give time for responses. A participant noted in my um, research that because of their brain-based injury, they feared being seen as an idiot by staff. It took them time to formulate a question. It's a very easy thing for us to give time. The sector also likes to put people in categories. Keep the option open that someone may want to signify a diversity category on their application for membership, but bear in mind that they might not as well. Step into the disclosure space instead. Put your accessibility and diversity information on your website, put a sign on the door, run sessions on diversity, or just put a line on your name badge saying autism aware, diversity aware, everyone welcome. Ask yourself, how do you determine how the environment needs to be? How do you speak to the laws, the values and the ethos of information service provision in a way that empowers and provides? Have you provided all of your patrons an opportunity to speak into the survey creation rather than just in the survey response? What efforts do you make to make and engage with your users wherever and whenever they might be? And lastly, let's not forget that even when we might lack control, here's looking at you, centralised control of our website. There are often ways that we can troubleshoot around this. Does your service have a Google presence? Did you know that you can use suggested edit on, on Google to be able to update your hours, your busy times, add photos of the building to help with navigation and direction? You can even show photos of the inside bearing photo permissions, of course. Research also indicates that lower socioeconomic families, people with a disability and migrants may be more reliant on public transport. How do your users travel to you? 
are there street lights along the road from the nearest bus depot or transport hub to your library or information service? Consider your opening hours and the schedule of your services as well and partner with providers in the community and find out from your community members what services should you put on the table during the times where it's possible to visit you, either in line, online sorry, or in person. The times that you have your services available and how you provide them are a subtle way that you decide who makes use of those services. So that's a question for us to ponder as well. Who are you including in your service? And lastly, advertise where your closest toilet is. If it's in another building, make that clear. If you can, even mention the distance. Why are toilets important? Beyond the obvious reason, a response in my research really stood out. Toilets are the only space where you can be entirely alone in public. For someone with anxiety or social phobia, it may be the only place in the entire building where that person is able to sit, be with themselves and breathe. Toilets are a place of refuge. Just keep them clean. So this has been a really quick overview of some of the practical ways that we can speak to diversity in the sector. I'll note here again that a lot of this draws from my research with people with invisible disabilities. So it is very much focused on this area as well as my practical experience. It isn't exhaustive and the voices I've covered today won't be the case for everyone. That's all part of diversity too though. Part of diversity services in, is in recognising that no one table will ever be perfect or ideal, but it's a matter of continuing to evolve and innovate. I'll speak to this with the voice of another participant's observation. She's a 25 year old girl who brings the elderly seat cushion into the library and then sits them on a chair and uses them. We might meet the needs of our diversity groups, but can we improve upon this? Could the need be met in a better way? How can we enact diversity and accessibility in practical service provision? And lastly, ask yourself, how will you offer a seat at the diversity table? Thank you for listening to my presentation. I will now pass over to Nikki. Thanks, Beck. I get my share my screen. I, um, thanks everyone, I'm really excited to be here today. Um, to begin, I firstly want to acknowledge the First Nations people of the land in which I am situated, the Gaibal and Jawa peoples of the Toowoomba area, as well as the First Nations people where you are situated today. I also want to acknowledge the diversity of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples yeah, across Australia and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. I have been an advocate for access and inclusion for a while now, and some of you may know me from my professional endeavours to increase inclusivity within libraries and the higher education sector. However, the truth is my activism actually stems from my personal experiences as a disabled woman. You see, I was born with a connective tissue disorder that affects my vision, hearing, spine and joints. I'm hearing impaired and wear hearing aids every day. I'm also visually impaired and lost most of my vision from a retinal detachment at the age of 13. This is what a lot of my life has looked like. And although my vision has improved over time, losing my sight taught me that to truly understand inclusion, you need to understand exclusion. And the reality is exclusion often happens unintentionally because sometimes we get all caught up thinking that since we're all nice people, that inclusion will just take care of itself, right? Libraries are open to everyone. We don't discriminate. We don't make money. We're holders of diverse histories and diverse stories. However, inclusion doesn't just happen because we have good intentions. We have to work for it. And we have a lot of work to do. Because here's the reality. Library anxiety is a real thing and has been defined as the outright fear of libraries and the librarians that work there. Research has found that clients often feel inferior, scared and out of place on libraries. So how can we make our libraries more inclusive? 
Firstly, let's start by ensuring our content and spaces are accessible. Let's lower our desk and our shelves. Let's have a mixture of quiet sensory safe spaces and collaborative spaces. Let's use height adjustable furniture and implement universal design principles within our services. However, let's also remember that it's not just the infrastructural changes that are important. I think sometimes we focus too much on the extraordinary goals that we forget small changes can often make the most difference. Small changes such as adding image descriptions, adding closed captions to videos, avoiding the use of library lingo when we communicate, and using camel hashtags on social media. So for those of you who don't know, a camel hashtag is where you capitalize each word in your hashtag so it can be read by people who are using text-to-speech software. One of my other greatest recommendations is to take advantage of accessibility checkers. Both Microsoft Word and Adobe have inbuilt accessibility checkers that will highlight any accessibility errors and provide clear, simple instructions on how to fix them. I've also gone one step further and have embedded Vision Australia's accessibility toolbar into my Word documents. And seeing it there in my toolbar always reminds me to check my accessibility and to not make it an afterthought. I also wanted to highlight that access does not always equal inclusion. Before entering the library profession, I worked at an architectural design firm and there were often discussions about designing buildings to meet accessibility requirements. This often involved creating a side door or ramp that went through the back of the building to cater for wheelchair users. These solutions did meet accessibility standards, but were they inclusive? No. To me, inclusive access in this example means that everyone would be able to get through the front door. I wanted to share this example so when you are creating your own content and designing your own spaces, to remember there is a difference between the tick the box type of accessibility and the notion of inclusive access and authentic inclusivity. My second tip is to prioritise and advocate for open education. At the University of Southern Queensland, where I work, many students are first in family from regional, rural and remote areas, from low SES backgrounds, and most balance work, family and study. The cost of textbooks is an issue of access for students globally, and USQ has chosen to invest in open textbooks as one controllable financial burden to students that we can relieve. This year in particular, the pandemic has highlighted the need for seamless access to education and educational resources. Encouraging staff, staff to adopt, adapt or offer high quality, flexible, accessible learning resources is a student-centred strategy that aligns with good learning and teaching practices with a commitment to social justice. So I encourage you all to take the small steps of advocating for open educational practice at your institution to start adopting or adapting open textbooks. Um, the Open Textbook Library is a really great place to start looking for potential open texts. Also, encourage the use of open assessments, where students become co-creators of open artifacts and the voices of students are truly included, valued and disseminated within the community. Students currently face many sources of financial burden, such as rent, food, bills, textbooks and tuition fees. But of all those costs, the only one that we can control directly is textbooks. We have the power to make accessible and inclusive changes that directly influence students' lives through our advocacy for inclusive access via open education. I wanted to share some of the USQ's published open textbooks in the School of Education. All the books we have published took diversity into consideration and the impact diversity has on making students feel included and valued. The book on the left, Gems and Nuggets, was actually created by students themselves and gave them a sense of agency and inclusion in being able to contribute to the profession they were striving to be a part of. Additionally, accessibility is the core of our open textbook production process. We use a publishing platform called Pressbooks, which allows the books to be exported in different formats, including text-to-speech. 
Interestingly, we found students without a disability appreciated the text-to-speech option too, simply because they prefer to give their eyes a break from reading the screen and they could do other tasks while listening to the book. This shows that accessibility benefits everyone, not just those with a disability. Lastly, when people walk into a library, they should be able to see a part of themselves in their environment. That is the hallmark of an inclusive place. Creating an inclusive library means we put all kinds of faces on our marketing material. It means we have diverse artwork and diverse displays and not just for particular days of the year. It means we diversify our collections and our profession so we are more representative of the glorious diversity within our community. Let's undertake diversity audits and review our reading list to ensure our collections contain diverse resources by diverse authors. Because without diversity, our libraries are only telling one story from one point of view with one set of biases. Our world isn't like that and our libraries shouldn't be either. The paraphrase Sims Bishops when people cannot find themselves reflected in the books they read or when the images they see are distorted, negative, laughable, or even unrealistic, they learn a powerful lesson about how they are devalued in a society of which they are a part. This is why libraries play such an important role in promoting marginalized voices, representing the invisible and acknowledging the intersectionality. Diversity recognises the ways we differ and inclusion honours those differences. And the way we put that into action is through representation. Authentic, diverse, realistic representation. Inclusion starts with each one of us. The greatest services we provide in libraries are bound to the people in our profession. Start making inclusion a priority in your library and start by focusing on yourself and your actions. We need to be aware of self before we can be aware of others. We need to remember that inclusion is a learning journey that we must all start as individuals. Inclusion is often found in our smallest day-to-day -day interactions, the way we connect with our clients and colleagues, listening with empathy, challenging our assumptions, cultivating our own self-awareness and making an effort to understand another person's experience. Inclusion is about fighting against exclusion. It's about speaking up about the things that need to be spoken about. Inclusion is about asking questions and having courageous conversations. It's about being vulnerable and sharing parts of yourself with others. And above all, inclusion is about valuing others and accepting and cherishing the parts that others share with you. We need to remember that being kind, <laughs> relational and compassionate can really go a long way. And that empathy is our greatest, most essential asset to the work we do in libraries. And we need to harness that now more than ever. Thank you so much. Now I'm gonna hand it over to Sarah for her presentation. Thank you so much, Nikki. That was fantastic. Are you done? Um, I'll just be a moment. Okay. Um, uh, hi, um, my name is Sarah Fenley. Um, I'm one of the digital designers at Deakin University Library. And today I'm going to talk you through the process of how we developed our suite of Deakin Library characters. So the development of our characters was part of um, a, two larger projects that we were undertaking. The first project was creating a library design system and our design system is a website that contains digital components and assets that help us manage consistency of look, feel, functionality um, across our digital environment, 
and to maintain accessibility, brand and design standards. A large part of the design system contains design elements and templates for librarians to use in the broader and the broader library staff to use in their own digital content. Our main goal of creating this, um, this section was to give our librarians access to graphics that were within branding guidelines that they didn't have to go in search of and could therefore create a consistent experience um, for our students. The second project was a six series digital literacy animated video project uh, that I was doing in conjunction with our library teaching and learning team. There were two stages to our character designs, so I'll step you through stage one. Because we wanted the characters to be part of those two projects, um, we identified some key requirements that they needed to fill. Firstly, they needed to fit within the broader Deakin branding and styling um, that had already been established by the university's internal marketing team. Secondly, there needed to be a large selection of characters as they would be used in a multitude of ways um, from in, in modules, animated videos, digital displays and communications. Thirdly, we wanted them to represent our Deakin cohort and the global community. And finally, we wanted the characters to be likeable, engaging and relatable. Um, we really wanted students to have a positive online experience. The Deakin marketing team had already developed a few characters that they were using in some internal student focused advertising. Uh, there were about five videos that they had developed. I contacted our marketing team to see if we could use those characters. However, they wanted to keep them specifically um, for that campaign. So I asked if we could develop our own characters using the same styling to theirs to make sure the characters look like they were a part of the same suite. Um, and that was because students had already been exposed to them. So this would help create a consistent experience for our students. Marketing agreed uh, to this as long as we um, kept them in the loop and they were able to have some input into the final approval of the characters. At this stage, um, myself and the library teaching and learning team put our com combined experience together to identify our student cohort. I felt like more, the more knowledge that we could gain about our student cohort, the better we could ensure that the characters represented everyone. I'd previously worked with our UX specialist on developing our library user persona handouts as well as working with diversity and inclusion on a joint project called the Human Library. That was for the International Day Against Homophobia, Biphobia, Intersexism and Transphobia Week. So I believe that the more knowledge that you can gain, the better design that you can do. Using our combined knowledge, we went ahead and developed nine characters for our initial release. And those characters were Jamal, Trent, May, Amal, Ira, Priya, Siobhan, Thelma and Lee. These characters each have four suggested names that staff can use in their scenarios and modules. Um, they also have a student outfit that is more casual wear and a workplace and work placement outfit. We try to make sure that these outfits fitted within the four different schools at Deakin and those schools are Arts and Ed, Science, Engineering and the Built Environment, Business and Law and Health. We sent uh, these designs to our marketing team and they were happy with the characters so far. We were on quite a tight deadline uh, to get these characters released as the design system was going live and the animated videos needed to be released and embedded into coursework. We knew the design system would be regularly updated with new content. So we were happy to make these characters live as we could adjust and, and adapt them if and when required. So now we'll talk about the stage two of our character designs. 
At this stage, we wanted to have a more in-depth chat about whether or not we had actually ca captured all of our cohort or if we could be more and do more to be inclusive. We wanted to develop an Aboriginal character and a Torres Strait Islander character to represent our Nakiri cohort. To help us, we reached out to the Head of Diversity and Inclusion, who put us in contact with the Cultural Diversity and LGBTIQA plus representative, and also the Chair of Race Relations at Deakin. We had an initial meeting with both stakeholders and they were really pleased with our initial nine characters that we had designed. They really liked them and they were really happy with them. But they had identified three new characters that we could design. Firstly, a non-binary character. Secondly, a First Nations female character. And finally, a male character with mental health issues. So um, for the next example going forward, um, I thought I would follow the process that we did for developing our non-binary character. So the first step, in the first step, we had a, a great uh, robust conversation with the LGBTIQA plus representative and the diversity and inclusion team, where we were able to discuss the different styling of the character. So we had a chat about what the character would be wearing, their hair colour, clothing colour, the shape of the character, the character's names, um, the character's area of study. From the knowledge that we gathered, I had a meet uh, from that meeting, I developed three versions of the character. Once I'd created those three character designs, um, the diversity and inclusion team added them to a survey and sent that out to the LGBTIQA plus cohort, who then voted on um, both the name and the character design that they felt best represented them. So from the results, character A um, was the character of choice, which got 68.7% of the vote. The character names that we developed with diversity and inclusion were also, in, um, were also chosen and Sam was picked as the primary name as it had 47% of the vote. This part of the process took quite a few uh, months all up. There was a lot of correspondence and waiting for feedback. I think it's really important to note that this second stage of the character design, um, we decided to have a very loose time frame. We didn't want there to be an additional element of stress to this project, as we knew there would be a lot of stakeholders and the process may be a lengthy one. The key was to keep in regular contact and checking in with our stakeholders to keep the project moving forward. Although it was slow at times, it always progressed. Once I got the feedback um, from the survey, I did the final refinements of character A, creating their professional outfit and adding um, them to the coloured circles. And once they, these were created, I sent the final designs back to the stakeholders again to get their final sign off for Sam. And this is the same process that we followed for each of our characters. And we ended up with four all up. And they um, were Christine, our Torres Strait Islander character, Jasper with an assistance dog, Kalinda, our Aboriginal female character, and Sam, our non-binary character. They're now in wide distribution throughout our modules, communications, they're in libguides, digital displays, and they have been added to our library design system. And in the future, we would really like to build on our character suite and expand it further. So the key takeaways um, that I got from this project, um, the first one uh, was to document your requirements. I think it's really important um, that you try and note down what do you want from these characters? So how will they be used? Will they be animated? Will they be used in print or digital? Um, what platforms will you put them on? Will they be in libguides or H5P activities or PowerPoint presentations? Secondly, figure out who the people with the best knowledge are and ask them for help. So 
relate those relational connections, um, the time you take building those relationships in your organisation is really important. I was very fortunate that I built a, a good working relationship with the head of um, diversity and inclusion before this project. So I was able to reach out to them and they were so helpful. I think being genuine and having goodwill towards making something for students and helping each other is incredibly important um, for, this, for this project and I guess for all projects really. <laughs> um, thirdly, uh, loose timeframes may be required um, the comfort and being comfortable with an iterative model of design. Um, design should always be developing um, as you gain as you gain more knowledge and experiences um, what you design will change and update um, for the better so don't let your design sit sit and become stagnant and lastly identify any branding restrictions and constraints uh, that you may to need to adhere to and how they're not necessarily a negative um, in this scenario, we had the constraint of styling the character uh, of the style of the characters um, as we needed them to fit within the, the marketing's um, design that they'd already developed for their characters. And that could have been a constraint. However, because I didn't need to spend time coming up with an actual style from scratch, I had more time to really focus in on developing who the characters would be. And so that's how we got our characters. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, thanks, Sarah. Um, so my name's Hugh uh, and I'm on Wurundjeri land today. And I've, I've been asked to uh, provide some insights uh, based on our three speakers, but given that they've provided enough insights amongst the three of them, um, that's a bit daunting. So what I'm gonna do is just give you a very brief summary in case you uh, had to step out for a moment there or you <clears throat> missed one of those talks. Uh, and then I will kick us off with our first question. I do encourage you uh, while I'm speaking to take a look at the Slido and add your own questions because your questions are probably gonna be more interesting than mine. Um, so Beck kicked us off talking about offering everyone a seat at the table in line with our professional ethics, integrating a welcoming approach into our service models at the beginning with diversity by design, giving us insights from her research. Uh, Beck talked about knowledge as power when it comes to making libraries more accessible and more diverse. Nikki shared some ideas uh, with us about, well, more, more than some ideas, but uh, she, she also shared some insights about library anxiety and how that's really a result of new library users feeling out of place or unwelcome in libraries. Uh, she talked about understanding incl uh, that inclusion requires understanding exclusion. And Nikki encouraged us to design our libraries and services so that everyone can come through the front door, both literally and figuratively. Nikki also gave us some really practical things to do and to think about uh, to make our libraries and our services and our events even more inclusive and talked about inclusion as a learning journey that starts with understanding ourselves and our own assumptions. And then finally, Sarah took us through the process of creating a diverse range of characters for use in graphic design at Deakin, uh, so that as many students as possible can see themselves represented in the marketing and instructional material coming out of the library. Uh, Sarah and colleagues work with the restrictions from marketing to create a standardized high quality toolkit for the library to use in a range of material. And I, that, was, that was also a common theme there, working, working within restrictions and not seeing them as, as a barrier, but seeing them sort of as a an opportunity or even a, a bonus. Um, as, as Sarah just said, that it, it sort of means that you know what you don't need to think about because there's no point worrying about it. So hopefully I've, I've sort of captured uh, some of the spirit there. Um, so I do have a question and I'm sorry, there's a bit of a lead up to this. Nikki and Sarah both talked specifically about the importance of library users seeing themselves in our collections, our marketing and so on. 
and Beck spoke about her research into catering to invisible disabilities. Now on Tuesday, Sarah Lambert also emphasised both the importance of a diverse range of students recognising themselves in the examples and characters within educational texts, and also about the desirability of emphasising the abilities of people who have some kind of disability so that we focus on what they can do rather than what they can't. So my question is, does this complicate the way we depict and recognise library users with invisible disabilities? Uh, and Sarah, I'd like to sort of kick this to you to start because you, uh, you said you were asked to depict a student with mental ill health. So can you start by just letting us know um, how you approach that request? Sure, Hugh. Um, so firstly, um, I think the important thing is, is that um, it was, I ensured that I had people around me with that knowledge. So it wasn't just, um, I guess, my opinion or my bias on this. So I think um, that's something that I found incredibly important. And we did develop a few different characters. Um, but we were concerned, I guess, as a whole, um, both with diversity and inclusion and myself and the teaching and learning team that we didn't want this character to feel gimmicky. Um, and we wanted to take a moment and really have a look at what um, we were trying to represent. And we all came to the conclusion that any one of those characters could have uh, mental health issues it's um, you, you don't have to depict something in a certain way to show that um, and we were hoping that uh, that the cohort would be able to identify with the characters that we had made um, if they uh, did have mental health issues um, that they could see themselves in those characters um, and that was the important thing I think is just making sure that it wasn't um, gimmicky I think that that to me is really um, that's your responsibility that's my responsibility and our teams um, we also have um, I'd also like to take a look in the future as well and have and see how else we might be able to develop um, the characters as well so that's something I think ever should be ever developing um, and you really should as more knowledge is known you take that that moment um, to to work through and and get the right people involved and keep developing so i hope that answers the question that was great beck or nikki did you want to add anything to that um, yeah i agree with um Stella. like i think it's just really about normalizing it like um, as someone with a disability, when I was growing up, I always read books where I saw pictures where they exaggerated the disability and there was such a negative connotation to it, even if it was invisible or physical. So I think it's just really about making it normal and not around the idea of suffering. It's just that people with disability and invisible disabilities live really ordinary lives just like anyone else. And I think depicting that and making it empowering and normal is just what we need to do, yeah. I very much agree. And here I'm going to go back to when I was putting in my proposal for my doctorate. And one of the questions I was asked by the panel who overlooks the proposal in the ethics panel is, how will you tell if they have an invisible disability? And my response was, do I need to? If someone identifies as having a disability, having an invisible disability, that is something that that person has identified. It's not for me to interrogate or investigate that and determine whether that is legitimate. So I'm also, I'm always very concerned when it, we talk about um, designs in libraries and I really agree with what Sarah said and what Nikki said, that it is a whole of party approach that we talk in partnership, we involve people and working in that space that we hear all the voices that we can do. Thank you. Fantastic responses. I'm going to go to our Slido questions now. So if you not, haven't looked at Slido yet, um, now's your opportunity to get your questions answered. Uh, we have a couple of questions at the top, so I'll start off with those. Um, is there a template, or I suppose there's probably multiple options here. Is there a template you have for 
libraries to do a diversity audit. Um, so I'm not sure who specifically that was aimed at, but probably Nikki. Yeah, <laughs> there's um, plenty online. My favourite would probably have to be um, the one by, I think it's Teen Toolbox on Twitter. She does a young adult, so she's got fantastic resources. I'll, I'll put a link in the chat. Um, but I think it's always about adapting um, the template to suit what you're actually looking for. I know some people go through the whole collection and they do really um, into the data where some people might focus on on Pride Month, I'm going to look at my LGBTIQ representation. So there's different ways to do it and you can do um, templates depending on what you need. But um, I'll definitely, um, I'll tweet out some resources and I'll post some in the chat too. Fantastic. Um, Becca, Seth, do you have anything to add on that? It's okay if the answer's no. <laughs> um, the resources available through Equity Resource Centre and there's also some American ones through the American Library Association. Even though they require a bit of translation, of course, for an Australian context, they can be useful for getting the conversation started. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, and we also have a question about um, using assistive technology. Uh, if you've got any tips or success stories, uh, specifically in libraries, sorry. I'm just going to throw out here because I love assistive technology <laughs> and this is again something that was one of the criteria of my ethics approval and oh my gosh there are so many amazing programs available and lots of them are free and easily available so if you have an Android if you have an iPad look for things like um, word to, um, word to text and text to word there's even Auslan translators so you can put a program on your um, device and you can type in words and it will translate it into Auslan which is amazing personally I'm all just like all library staff should at least be able to say like hello how can I help you everything like that in Auslan but anyway my bias is showing so <laughs> there is so many different things that you can have and they're all free they're low cost um, I'm going to do a shout out to the toilet conversation again as well because there are also apps that you can put on your device that show you the locations of public toilets when you're traveling and they also show you um, wheelchair accessible ones down to ones where you can navigate back to your car and these sort of things as well. So there are so many different apps available and they're free and I'm always happy to wax the record about accessibility features so hit me up. <laughs> so. There you go. So if you're interested in more information about assistive technology, Beck is the person to speak to. Uh, Nikki, did you have anything more you wanted to add on that? Uh, not really. Um, like personally, I don't have any um, formal experience in assistive technology. It's things I've learned myself, so I've just taught myself the basics. But um, we're really lucky in the UTQ library. Um, we've got a a staff member who's a former assistive technology um, technology technician so I always go to him for any questions and um, also I think it's about um, making connections with your student equity team and I do that quite often as well so you don't need to have a knowledge just connect with people who do. Fantastic. Um, now we've got a we've got a couple of questions that are specifically for Sarah here but I want to pick up on two questions which are more or less the same. Um, which is about the lack of diversity within the library profession, um, you know, and I can talk about this as the, the token able-bodied uh, white man, which is obviously why I was asked to host this discussion on, you know, diversity and accessibility. Um, do you have any thoughts or suggestions or ideas about, um, you know, we talk about this ad nauseum, um, what do we need to do? <laughs> To, to make the, uh, the profession uh, more representative of uh, the people who actually are using our libraries and indeed those who um, perhaps aren't. Um, I, so um, I guess from a design perspective, um, I, there's a couple of um, things I think you can think about. Um, I guess, Firstly, um, recognizing your sort of um, un unconscious biases and understanding those and what they are. Um, I think taking just a look at our community as a whole, I think engaging with um, people who engage with your cohorts and, and the student cohort that you're a part of. Um, I think um, 
just I guess from a from design I I would want everybody to be able to enjoy it and look at it and and get something positive from it um, especially if students are um, doing work and they're going on to do uh, something that's like online learning or watching a video I want them to be concentrating on the content not getting or feeling anything negative because of something I've designed so um, it's making sure that you think about those things I think at the beginning of your projects um, so for example with accessibility um, I'm not an accessibility expert but we have um, accessibility experts within our team so I've had a small amount of say foundational training in that um, so it's something that I'm aware of and I always make sure that it's a part of the beginning process of a project. Um, and I think the same thing if you're doing character designs, um, anything like that, it's, it's having those, making sure that you are aware and that you make sure you carry that through and you get in contact with the right people who can help you and in your organisation to make the best design that you possibly can. I hope that again answers the question. probably should unmute myself. Thanks, Sarah. That's That was great. Beck, I do want to bring you in at this point because I know you've got you've done a lot of research and you've got a lot of things to say about hiring practices uh, in, in libraries. Can you um, talk about that? You're quite right. So a bit of a plug here. Um, the Alia Workforce Diversity Report 2019 is a must read for anyone in a hiring role. Um, Earlier this year, it's just been published. Um, two of my supervisors and myself undertook an analysis of Australian LAS job advertisements collected during January and February. So we found 208 advertisements and we're just running the data for America. So about 2000 over there. And we're looking at things like wording, so equal opportunity statements, specifically extending welcome to diversity groups to actually apply, how the advertisement kind of communicates uh, what the workforce is and the diversity within the profession as well. So needless to say, we found that Australian LIS jobs, and we suspect it will be the same case in America as well, so we're not unique here, that there are areas where we can grow. So one of the things that stood out to us that we quite found quite interesting was the use of the term reasonable adjustments whenever disability was mentioned. So speak to us and we will consider reasonable adjustments. We're all learned and we all know that reasonable adjustments is a terminology used by the Australian, um, or basically is during disability legislation, it is permitted um, terminology, but it is also something that when people are confronted with that, it's much like we were saying before, oh, you'll make a determination whether my adjustment is reasonable or not. What if it's not reasonable? Is it worth my while actually even applying for this? Let alone when you're actually reading the wording and another one that came up um, last year when we did the same was all applicants would be subjected to a medical examination. We assume that they meant successful applicants would be submitted for a medical examination. But the way that it had been worded and structured was already by itself a hurdle. It was saying, when you come in, you will be judged if you are medically fit to even apply for this role. These sort of wordings that we put in there, and we don't necessarily think of what they might mean. Another thing is that we might say, you must have a license to be able to apply for this role. Why? Can we not get there on public transport? If there's a requirement to drive a vehicle, okay, that's okay. But when there isn't that requirement, why do we have that hurdle in there? So it's an area that I feel quite passionate about, about how our wording in our advertisements can inevitably shape who we have even apply and who we then shape with our profession and with our service, because we put all of these barriers up and then wonder, why is our profession not diverse? Thanks, Beck. Uh, Nikki, did you have anything you wanted to add? 
Yeah, school? I absolutely agree with Beck. Like, as someone with a disability, I would never apply for jobs that had a driver's license because I can't drive because of my eyes. Um, and also with the um, doing the medical test as well. So it is a it really puts me off applying and wanting to work with that organisation when I see that. Um, also, as someone who's also worked in HR and diversity and inclusion, I agree with Sarah that it's about unconscious bias. And yeah, it's, it's really about that because I think employees have a tendency to employ their many means. They look at people who look and sound like themselves. And um, yeah, so that is that is a huge tendency. So we need to break that down. Um, that's why I think we should be doing blind applications. I really, I really do think that. Um, and I also think we need to change our application processes. So a lot of the time we ask um, potential candidates to write cover letters that's not always, it's not really flexible for people who prefer to do a video. So people learn and they communicate in different ways and we need to cater for that. We should say, you can write or you can do a two minute video because people have different strengths and we're playing to people who are better writers. So I think things like that need to change as well. Um, I think we also need to be more flexible when it comes to library degrees. Um, I think it should be it could be really any degree. Like if you're working in an academic library, I think it should be any degree with some experience um, and also more internships. I think that needs, people need to get their foot in the door. So yeah, there's some of my recommendations. Thank you, Nikki, that's fabulous. And um, quite timely, I think at the moment with Alia doing their review into uh, less education. And as I'm sure we're all aware, the number of library schools is rapidly diminishing in Australia as we speak. Um, I just before we leave this topic, I do want to address this one of the specific questions we had here, which was around cultural diversity. Um, Nikki, I I feel like your answer you just gave probably um, speaks to that somewhat. But uh, did any of you have anything you would like to add on that in particular? I think it's little changes, like um, at my university, uh, like Refect are. Uh, catering area has the different foods from different cultures and they have the flag of the culture like I think that's a wonderful way of making students feel valued so that's something really simple you can do um I think it's also about just diversifying our collections obviously um so my family comes from a migrant background and my grandparents don't speak English and they love libraries and they can hardly find any books in their native language so I think it would be great to have more things in different languages um and I also think it's important not to assume anything about culture so I tutor a lot of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students and a lot of them don't look Aboriginal and they may have assumptions about their kind of like white people too and that stuff, but that's not true. That's an assumption you've made about them. So we need to be careful that we're not making assumptions about culture, just like the way we do with disability as well. Thank you, Nikki. Um, I can see Sarah has been addressing some of these specific questions in the chat, so I might. Uh, did you did you have anything you want you wanted to actually speak to Sarah, or shall I let you continue to do that? <laughs> I'm happy to. Um, I don't mind. I'm happy for you to, to keep going. Um, I guess it was in the relation to um, I think uh, Susan um, asked about. Um, whether um, we had thought about height and weight in with the characters um, and in the design. So we try to incorporate that and I definitely did. Um, and some of the characters are shorter and taller and some of them are different weights. Um, however, it's something I'd really like to explore further um, and develop a lot further as well. So that's, um, again, that, that continuous iterative design um, process to, to keep um, developing um, the graphics to to suit the cohort. Great, thank you. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to make sense of these questions. So we have we have a comment about. Um, I think this is pretty true. You know, li librarians obviously, well, not obviously, but you know, generally feel quite comfortable in in libraries. There. We feel like we're, we're library kind of people, uh, which makes sense. Um, but do any of you have any resources to recommend or, or maybe some strategies uh, to shift our mindset so that we can um, try to be more, more in the heads of people who feel very uncomfortable uh, in a, a, 
either a traditional library or even in, an, in what we might consider a modern library. I'm just going to step in here. Um, I have previous experience with the federal government with rehabilitation services, working with people with multiple presenting issues, including disability. One thing that I was commonly told when I was working with my clientele was libraries aren't for me. Libraries are for other people. Libraries are for people that don't have Tourette's. Libraries are for people that don't have social phobia. Libraries are for people that don't look like me or have my background. I think one of the most powerful ways that we can actually interrogate our library service, and I don't use that word lightly, I mean that we really have to interrogate it, is through partnership. It's through asking people, it's through being willing to have those conversations and going to that table with an open mind, really. The things that work for us might not necessarily work for others. So there is, of course, some degree of compromise, but I'll reflect back here on what Nikki was saying as well about things like height adjustable desk. One thing that came out of my research was having a seat available near the desk or having a sign even saying line up here for help. Having these sort of subtle ways that you can indicate around the space that we are thinking of you and we have tried to include a numerous array of voices. I think it's a challenging area, but I think really reflecting back the partnerships of the way forward here. Thank you, Beck. Sorry, just uh, forgot how to control my computer for a moment there. Uh, yeah, Sarah, did you have anything you wanted to add uh, on that topic? Yeah, I agree with Beck that it's about connecting with community. So I'm um, at my institution, I've joined things like the Ally Network and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Network. And it's just to really talk about how they feel. And I, when I do my presentations, when my last presentation in Adelaide, I actually sat down with a group of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and said, what does your ideal library look like? And they came up with things like seeing acknowledgement of country when we walk in or uh, going to the help desk and having the library staff understand what Indigenous methodology is. So, you know, like it's just about asking those questions about what is your ideal library? What can we do to change things? And once you start having those courageous conversations, then you can try and put things in a memo to your management and get things actually um, changed. But it's just to start, it's to start off, you've got to have the conversation with the people, um, yeah. And on that topic, just going to interrupt for one second and say mental health posters in the bathrooms, put a sign up saying black dog, these sort of things reflect that you see mental health as a legitimate thing and that it exists and recognise that. Put signs on the door, not just saying that guide dog is welcome, service dog. Don't use the terminology guide dog, use service dog. Make all of these small changes just to reflect that this is legitimate and you are legitimate for experiencing this. Sorry, Sarah. Please don't apologise. <laughs> um, I completely agree with both Nikki and Beck, where it's really, um, again, about finding um, and asking the questions and finding the right people with the right skills. Don't just assume that you have those skills. Um, and for, for, from a design perspective, for us, it's about... Um, our library has really invested in getting specialists in in areas. So user experience specialists, um, specialists for accessibility on specifically, I guess, digital um, I'm talking about um, in our team. And I think that that's, that's important is that um, making sure that staff have a foundational understanding or a foundation of understanding but then getting those people in who can really guide you and and really give you that inf um, the, the correct information and it, it it empowers you to be able to make something great for the students and that's really at the end of the day that's what you know you, you're trying to do is give a, a, a really great experience and um and I think that Definitely um, from a design perspective, it's getting those, having those right conversations and getting the right feedback as well. So that's where our UX specialists come in, where they, they go out and they speak to the students and you get feedback. So you can adjust your designs again to make it even more accessible and more inclusive. So, um, yeah. So don't turn your microphone off yet, Sarah, because I'm going to follow up on that point, we uh, we did have a question uh, in the Q&A about uh, your 
whether you've had any feedback um, on your characters. So uh, personally, I was really impressed by your process of, um, you know, doing a lot of consultation uh, in the creation of those um, those assets. But um, you did talk about that sort of being an ongoing process. So has there have you had a chance to sort of get any feedback on that uh, since you created them? Yeah, so I get feedback from um, through the librarians um, from the different schools. Um, I get some feedback. Um, we've had feedback um, and can gather feedback from our UX specialists to see um, where adjustments need to be made. But so far, it's been positive. So it's something I'd also like to um, sit in the future with our um, and have a a sit in the library and have a lap, have a laptop open and see if we can get students to come over and just have a chat and, and just get just feedback and adjust and, 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 and make um, any changes. But yes, we've had positive feedback um, again through the, library, through the librarians. Um, and so far, again, it's been all positive, but I'd like to, um, I'd like to get some more, so. <laughs> Fantastic. Um Becca or Nikki, did you want to um, add anything about um, getting responses or feedback from library users? Multiple formats, multiple time. Um, it really stood out to me, especially when I was talking to people with brain injuries. It takes time to formulate a response. And if we have, say, um, one thing I'm a fan of is having multiple ways that people can interact with us. So at Victoria Uni, we have live chat, we have phone, we have um, email, and we have what we call the virtual service desk, which is a Zoom mitigated service like this. It's important to have different services so that people can connect how it works for them. And also having ways that they can leave a message, they can write an um, email, so there's less time pressure as well. So I think that that's one of the big things. Yeah, and I agree. And I think it, it goes beyond disability to even think of like personality, like introversion and extroversion. Like I'm an introvert and I can't give feedback on the spot. I really need to think about what I'm going to say and giving um, me the time to give appropriate feedback is something I really love. So definitely with different formats and allowing time for people who um, communicate in different ways. Fantastic advice. Thank you for that, all three of you. Um, so we have a couple more questions, which I, uh, to the people who have asked these questions, I know they're different, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna push them together because I feel like they may have this, the same answer. Um, so there's a question here about um, making sure that we are representing and addressing diversity in an environment where we may have uh, reduced or in fact no um, frontline staffing um, either permanently or temporarily. Uh, and then we also have a question from Jen, Eddie, about uh, the recent shifts to uh, much more online services that many of us have, have had recently and whether there's any new opportunities or new challenges uh, in that. So um, ho hopefully I'm not the only one who sees those two things as being connected. If you feel free to answer them separately if, if you don't. Uh, see the connection. <laughs> Happy for anyone to take that. We're very much again coming back down to the multiple ways of connecting with people. Um, I spoke earlier about things like uh, text to speech and speech to text and things like the mobile apps and these sort of things you can use around Auslan, you can use around translation spaces. Again, having those flexible options that people can choose what works best for them. Some people might, for example, prefer a video service because it allows them to convey body language and it allows them to engage in a more natural conversation. Something like a text service can be very good, but look at the biases that you're expecting in a text service as well. You're expecting someone to be able to read, process and respond in this one format without any um, body language without any non-verbal communication and it can be very difficult and that's for culturally um, and linguistically diverse groups but it's also for people who might be using that service who might have a disability as well. So 
to provide that sort of service, we need to stop looking around the ideas of we can only provide front desk and that's the only way we can provide this point, provide this point, and actually go, how can we provide multiple points? How can we upskill our staff? Because it's not a matter of just providing the service, it's about making sure that staff are trained and able and comfortable using those services to the best of their abilities. If we don't speak into that space, we're doing our users, our students, our members of the community a disservice. And we're once more putting that expectation that you will meet us how we tell you to meet us. So having those multiple formats, I think is really integral to having a service where we might have a reduced or no face-to-face um, -face presence on campus or in the branch or these sort of things it is still important that we look at different ways that we can provide those services in different formats. Thanks, Beck. All good points. Did anybody else have anything you wanted to add on that? Yeah, um, I guess, uh, um, again, uh, from the, the digital and designer perspective, um, the increase in um, that online learning space, I've noticed a lot this year, that it's been quite um, a large increase in, in helping design modules um, and work. And I think um, it's made me very much conscious of the amount of screen time people have to sit and sitting in front of a computer. Um, I, I had a broken collarbone last year. So sitting in front of a computer for a long amount of time was very difficult. So that kind of um, realizing that and, and sort of trying to ensure that your content, um, I guess, and the design isn't, it doesn't disadvantage um, any of your students. Um, is really important. So from a design perspective, when I sort of help out, um, I, I kind of take a look at how I can um, add graphics to, to um, maybe help chunk out the information a bit better that's being provided. Um, and making sure, for example, just that um, content, you know, works on devices and, and it, it, that kind of thing. Um, making sure that, um, you're not just looking at, I, I guess, one one place and one place only where, where it can be viewed, which is exactly what Beck was saying. Um, and I think um, making sure that that platform or whatever you're using is functioning correctly. Um, and, in you know, I, I try and um, read through the content and make sure that um, what I'm providing matches up. Um, and also that the graphics that I guess uh, that are being used are... Um, a lot of the time decorative um, and so I also you know make sure that you're you provide um, a sort of that old text with the graphic if required um, and but then making sure that if they're not um, that they're really they're fully accessible um, that they you know the colors are correct and making sure that if you're doing any um, for example, highlighted text in, in a bit of information that the different highlight colours um, are okay for people with colour blindness and, and, and that kind of thing. So it's, it's, you know, you constantly learn, but making sure that you remember these, these things and you add them to your design. And always know, I guess, if it's digital, you can update it and you can, you can make the small change. It doesn't, it doesn't take much to, to adjust. Um, I think one of the challenges for me this year has been around copyright, which I see lots of people have mentioned in the chat. And I think obviously the pandemic has really um, amplified that because not being able to access our text on campus. Um, but it's always been an issue for me in my role because I started supporting incarcerated students who didn't have access to the internet. And so that meant they couldn't access anything from my library databases. And I could only rely on that 10% of the textbooks. So they were missing out on heaps of content that online students could. Uh, so there was a huge equity issue here. But the thing is with that comes opportunities and the opportunities are in the open educational space. So I'm really lucky that USQ has been really pushing that. So, and it's been, um, the pandemic has been a really great way to communicate with academics why open education resources are so important. So we've taken the opportunity to really um, advocate for that using the pandemic as our reason as well. Fantastic. So I do want to pick up on that last point from, from Nikki. Um, we've got about five or so minutes. 
left. Um, what are what are the opportunities? So um, I'm sure you know we've got over 100 people uh, here today. I'm sure they're all feeling deeply inspired and ready to roll up their sleeves and get cracking. Um, what are what are your sort of uh, top top tips for things to to start with? I guess you know where's the uh, where's the opportunities, particularly in the in the sort of COVID new normal, um, and uh, Where's the about to say low-hanging fruit, but everybody is sick of that? Uh, the uh, where are, where are the um, you know the the um, the, the best best places to to begin? I guess happy for anyone to uh, start us off. Or, or even just what do you what do you want people to uh, to focus on? I guess what's your pet project you want everybody here to go off and do something about? Um, I think everyone should just start learning the basics of accessibility, like things how to like do your image descriptions and closed captions. I think that's the way everyone should start. Like to be a diversity and inclusion champion, you've got to practice what you preach, and I think it's making sure that your own content is accessible. Um, yeah, and my major opportunity at the moment is for open education space. And I do think at the moment, we also have the opportunity with the early reviews to really consider how to diversify our profession. Like, I think that's something that needs to be in the forefront of our minds as well. Go ahead, Beck. <laughs> So look for initiatives. Um, one thing that I often talk about is discomfort points. And anyone from Deakin would have already heard me discuss these, but these are points that we look at and they cause us some discomfort. They cause us confusion. They cause us concern. Look for things around your service that might cause you discomfort, but also ask others what are discomfort points to you. Once you know areas that you can look at, the task of looking at accessibility becomes so much not easier, but so much more manageable if you know where you can start and where you can begin. When you approach accessibility as a huge topic, it is very scary, but breaking it down into little steps and having achievements at each of those little steps can make it so much easier. I think um, if the, if your organisation um, is able to, like ours has, sort of invest in resourcing, getting the right people in. Um, from if you have designers at your library, um, uh, have, making sure, I guess, that they have some at least foundational training and understanding what they're designing um, and who they're de like, what they're designing and who they're designing for. Um, also, being able to provide support to your librarian. So that's a big part of what I do is having a des the design system that we've developed. A big part of that is, is there to support our librarians so that um, they can be confident in what they're using, um, is accessible and meets um, their, the students' needs. Um, and I think that Getting this, getting your specialists in if you can, or finding them within your organisation. Um, that's, I guess, the advice that I would say. Um, have as, as many as many people with as much knowledge as you can get, pretty much, and and uh, get as much feedback from your students as you can, and develop from there, that's, and design from there. And I'm just going to add. I agree fully with Sarah's points there, and. Also look at in-house training and initiatives that you can provide through your own staff. So say, for example, Victoria Uni with the DigiChat frontline um, training suite looks at everything from customer service to tech to support to searching, all of these sort of things. Look at the skills that you've already got amongst your staff. Exactly as Sarah says, look for people who are already speaking into this space and don't be scared to ask them because heavens knows, all of us are always very happy to have a chat. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Beck. Um, we had did we for all of you on that? We did. Yeah, we did. Yeah, and I think just to add to that, it just you're never going to achieve perfection. Like 
it's just so diverse that everyone has different needs so don't you know don't get mad at yourself because it's not going to be perfect um as long as you just have the courage to try um and you have your good intentions that's going to shine through i think fantastic so my last question uh and this is uh we actually this actually came up on tuesday as well but i don't want to miss it because it is something that is it comes up a lot because it's important and it's that question around um needing to uh talk to the people that you are trying to include and represent without overburdening them and you know making them constantly do the work for you uh, all the time you know it's that classic thing of um people who are you know uh minorities in society and and who are constantly asked to do the work of explaining themselves and what they need and how to represent them so do you have any tips on balancing that need to uh, not speak on behalf of people uh, and and to recognize them authentically without uh, giving them more work to do for you <laughs> i think in the design perspective um, like on this project how um, I or we engage with diversity and inclusion and um, and the chair of um, race relations at Deakin so um, all, although we do go to our students and ask um, the questions also going to, to the specialists as well because you can uh, you can lean on them a lot um, or well I leaned on them a lot more in this project and got their input so um, I, I guess from from that point of view, that sort of helps. Um, I would hope to uh, take that overwhelming um, approach that you were saying, where you don't want to overwhelm anybody. But you, there are well, for us, there's, there are representatives um, in the organisation, so to to get their um, advice and input. Um, I think it's about just doing some of the work yourself and um, getting them to look over it as like a consult. Um, also, if you're expecting people to guest speak and do training sessions all the time on diversity initiatives, pay them or make sure someone else is taking the extra workload off them um, or, or they have the actual time to do it in the actual job and they're not doing it in the extracurricular time. So yeah, I think they're my two points, um, I think. Think of bartering as well. What can you give in exchange? It doesn't have to be a one-way relationship and partnerships always work better when information shares both ways. So look at what you're bringing to the table, not just what someone else can. What are you going to do with this information? How are you going to translate it into practice? What can you do for them as well? And don't be afraid to ask as well. I would love to see this happen. How can we make this work? What can I bring to this? Just ask. Thank you, everybody. Fantastic. That's, that's all our time, unfortunately. I'm sure everybody could have listened to you for another hour. Um, so thank you so much, uh, Sarah, Nikki, and Beck. Um, that was a fantastic session. I really enjoyed it and um, it was pretty great being able to um, be part of it. Uh, I do want to uh, just mention that as a small token of thanks to the speakers for the webinar today, the Creek Seminar Committee in Kavala have arranged for native trees to be planted by a community group through uh, the organisation called 15 Trees. So um, thank you, Craig and Kaval. Please let us know what you thought about uh, this webinar. It's super important. You'll be sent an online survey shortly. Uh, and I know that uh, the Creek Seminar Committee really scrutinise uh, the answers to that survey um, to inform their future events, which is why they're always so great. Uh, so please fill that in for them and be as honest as you can. Uh, you can continue the conversation on Twitter uh, using the hashtag uh, Creek 2020 and if you came today and you were like this is so great i wish there was another session i could go to you're in luck because there is another one on wednesday the 18th uh, from 10 to 11 30 
Australian Eastern Time. Uh, and you can go to uh, cavile.edu.au to find out more about that. Um, I'll be there, I hope to see you there. And thank you to our speakers and thank you to everybody else for coming today.